What's up guys, we're back with another educational video and this week we are talking about heavyweights versus lightweights for building muscle and strength. But first, make sure you like the video, subscribe to the channel and leave a comment for the algorithm. By the way, before we get started, I know everyone's gonna comment on my nails. Uh, all the insecure uh, males are going to say things about my nails, I don't really care. Come beat me at nationals. All right, a new systematic review was published where they looked at tons of studies, like dozens of studies, examining different training loads and different repetition schemes and their impacts on muscular hypertrophy as well as maximal strength uh, as measured by one rep max and uh, isometric strength. And basically the question they were trying to answer was, if we compile all these studies, is there a consensus about whether high load, lower rep training or low load, high rep training is better for hypertrophy? And the answer was when both groups do similar amounts of sets and take them to a similar proximity of failure, there are very similar developments in hypertrophy. The load you select doesn't really seem to make a huge difference in terms of muscle hypertrophy so long as you take that given load close to failure and you do it for a similar number of sets, so a similar number of hard sets. This appears to only go to a certain level of low load. Once you get to like 20% of a one rep max, that appears to not produce the same hypertrophy benefits as say like 40 to 90% of a one rep max. For some reason, that's just so low. And my, my guess is that you don't really hit true failure at that light of a load because you know 20% of a one rep max on say a dumbbell curl for me might be like 12 pounds. I might get like a, a really good pump and close to failure failure, but then if I just rest a couple seconds and then try another rep, I can do another rep. And so maybe you're just not fatiguing that muscle enough, or maybe there is something to just needing a certain level of heaviness. And once you're past that level, it doesn't matter as much as long as you get close to failure. So a lot of this comes from, are there like hypertrophy rep ranges, you know, anywhere from like six to 15 reps is been considered like a, a traditional bodybuilding rep range? And the answer is that no, there doesn't appear to be a rep range that's specific for hypertrophy, but I will say that doing repetitions in that rep range probably makes a good bit of sense from the perspective that if you're using really light loads, it's gonna take a long time to get close to failure. And for me, I just get bored. Now, it's a great tool because some people may have injuries or maybe they don't wanna lift heavy or maybe they like getting a really you know, good pump when they lift. And so they prefer those light loads and that's cool. But those kind of moderate rep ranges, like six to 15, those allow you to use a load that isn't incredibly heavy, but you reach failure fast enough or close to failure fast enough that you're not spending like two minutes during an actual set. So while your traditional hypertrophy rep range is probably not like legit, from a practical perspective, it can still make sense. Where there was a difference in this study was on maximal strength development and maximal isometric strength. So people who trained with heavy loads did get better strength development than people who trained with lighter loads. And that's probably for a few reasons. The first and most basic reason is when they test maximal strength, they are testing a one rep max. One rep maxing is a specific skill set. If you take untrained people into a gym and you have them try to go to a one rep max on say a squat, a lot of times what will happen is they will absolutely smoke a weight, you'll go up five pounds and they'll get stapled. And it doesn't seem to make sense. And a lot of it is, one, they have not developed the ability to learn how to grind through discomfort. Two, they're not practiced at that specific skill under heavy loads. And so any kind of mistake or error uh, is likely to just pin them. And another reason is of the neural adaptations that can happen from training with heavy loads. You may have the same amount of muscle, but your motor neuron system gets better at recruiting more fibers to contract, gets better efficiency, and since you are practicing that lift under heavy loads, you get more skilled at the actual movement itself under heavy loads. Anyone who's ever done a one rep max squat 
knows how much more difficult it is to execute that than saying a weight you can do for 15 reps. And this is also why you can go to a one rep max calculator, put in your 10 rep max squat, and get really geeked about what it says your one rep max should be, and then when you try that one rep max, you get absolutely obliterated and stapled, because if you haven't practiced that specific skill, it's unlikely you're going to be able to express that skill. And one of the things I talk about with powerlifting is strength potential versus strength expression. A lot of the time we spend training in powerlifting isn't doing one rep maxes, it's building your base level of strength so that you have the strength potential, and then when you get closer to a meet, you start doing a lot more heavy singles, doubles, triples, so that you can express that skill on competition day. Now why not just do heavy singles, doubles, triples all the time? Well, it's very fatiguing, the risk of injury, those sorts of things. This review doesn't really show us anything we didn't already know, which is great. It tracks, it's in line with the rest of the research. Now, a lot of people will say something like, but I thought hypertrophy was created by mechanical tension. How can light loads produce similar hypertrophy as heavy loads? It doesn't make sense. Well, first of all, if it was all about mechanical tension at a single point in time, which is what a lot of people screw up, then just do the heaviest eccentric that you can lower slowly. That's the maximum mechanical tension. But mechanical tension is cumulative, obviously, not just throughout the course of a set, but throughout the course of sets. Your muscle is responding to the overall demand placed upon it, and it's adapting to that. So I do think it's important to get stronger as you progress, but stronger doesn't necessarily have to meet a one rep max. If you're doing sets of 15, I think it's important that you get better at doing sets of 15 and use more weight over time. Same thing, I think if you're doing sets of 30, you have to get better at doing sets of 30 or sets of five. You have to get stronger because that's a form of progressive overload or you're gonna have to add more hard sets. So one of the big limitations of this study was it was all in untrained men. So some people might say, well, the, you know, women might be different, people who are trained might be different, maybe, but the research in trained also tracks in the same direction. So most of the studies we have tend to show similar results as this systematic review. So I feel really comfortable that I think that this is a good representation of the evidence that out, that's out there. Yes, there's some research that shows that females are less fatigable, that they recover faster, they can maybe handle more volume, they're better at reps, but that doesn't mean that reps produce more hypertrophy for them, they just test better when it comes to reps. But the research shows that heavy versus light, as long as they do the same number of hard sets in the same proximity of failure, they get similar results. So it doesn't mean that just because women have more non-fatigable fibers that they should do more high rep work. That's not what that means. It just means they're gonna be better at the high rep work comparatively compared to males. If you guys have trouble, like how do I actually formulate it into a training program? Well, that's why I created the BioLearning Workout Builder so that you could get effective evidence-based programming with all of our evidence-based programs, but it gives you the flexibility to adjust your exercise selection. So we've grouped exercises in a way that if you wanna swap them out, they're still gonna be of similar effectiveness, but people have different options that they have at their gyms. Some people don't have access to a full gym. We have at-home programs, we have minimal equipment programs, and we have full gym programs. And we take all the guesswork out of how many reps should you do, what kind of intensity and weight should you use, how many sets, and then you get to pick the exercises within those groupings that you prefer, have access to, those sorts of things. So. It is a really awesome tool. We have thousands of super happy members and you can even find my training on there. The training I used to win nationals this past year is on the Workout Builder. So we're gonna give you guys access to the best tools out there to get stronger, build muscle, whatever your goal is. And yes, we do have female specific programs on there. Not that females should train differently because there's really no evidence they need to train differently, but you know, more emphasis on things like glutes, legs, you know, a lot of women want to prioritize those areas. So we have all those kinds of programs available and we have them all the way from beginner to advanced. So make sure you click the link in the description and sign up. I'll catch you guys next week.